On December 19, 2020, Natalia Pronina posted another post to her Instagram. A short video of snow-covered cottages and Christmas trees, which was accompanied by a few platitudes. Winter out of town is special, a beautiful weekend. Happiness is when you have someone to wish you good morning and good night, and just to know that they are waiting for you. The video was shot in one of the rooms of the Kanakava River Club Hotel near Moscow, where Pronina regularly went on vacation. This entry on her account would be her last. Four days later, on Wednesday, at 11 o'clock in the evening, when Natalia and two friends would approach the House 58 on Profsius Nye Street, where she rented an apartment. From behind a lamppost appears a man, more like a shadow, dressed in all black with a mask on his face. Catching up with the girls, the unknown assailant shrugs them off and shoots Natalia Weiss in the face with a Makarov pistol. The bullets, fired at point-blank range, did not leave her with a single chance. Despite the best efforts of the three ambulance crews and surgeons on call, she died in the hospital two hours later. Hello, this is Defunct City. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the bell so you don't miss new episodes and stay informed. Natalia Pronina was determined with her vocation once and for all. When her six-year-old grandmother first brought her to the dance studio, Natasha graduated from the Russian State University of Physical Culture in the Department of Complex Coordination Sports and later received another diploma. She has earned the title of Candidate Master of Sports and Sport and Ballroom Dancing, has taken master classes with the best choreographers in the world, has taken part in numerous Russian and British dance competitions including the world-famous Blackpool Dance Festival. Her professional career was on the rise. She taught stage movement at the Austin Kennedy V Center and occasionally glimpsed on the screen. She starred in Comedy Club, Open Kitchen, and Live Sound and on Channel One. Was a soloist and choreographer in various dance projects. Dancers at this level usually have a very solid portfolio of music videos. But in this field Natalia is something unlucky. Despite the bright, though not exactly a model looks, she starred in only two music videos. The line in her resume worked and collaborated with artists and singers of the Russian stage means only that she staged someone's movements behind the scenes and maybe a couple of times appeared in concert dances. But Natalia was able to fulfill the dream of any experienced dancer. In 2013, she opened her own dance studio on Garibaldi Street. She always wanted to teach and gladly worked with everyone from very young children to those who came to fitness clubs. Sometimes Natalia, together with her students, simply went out to Moscow parks, put on a sound board, and showed everyone dance moves. According to testimonies of friends and students, she practically never left her studio. She was also on her way out the night she was shot. A video blogger who has devoted as many as four clips to Pronina has rightly remarked that this is how bankers, mafia bosses, and thieves in the law are killed, but not dancers. The filmmaker acted according to the rules of action movies about the wild 90s, but as if he watched them in his distant childhood, while he himself has spent the past few years away from big cities and away from any civilization at all. He shot Natalia right under the lens of the entryway camera, ignored the two witnesses, and threw the gun 10 meters away around the corner of a neighboring house. In addition, he forgot to wear gloves before shooting and left traces of subcutaneous fat and sweat on the handle. In principle, he could have put his passport nearby but apparently he did not think of it. For this reason, the investigation first began to develop a version of revenge by a jealous admirer. The hired man could hardly have acted so unprofessionally, unless he was found in the newspaper in the services section. The list of suspects immediately included three Alex and her Kravchenko, a lifeguard from the Ministry of Emergency Situations from Yalta, Natalia's current boyfriend her former pianist from Samara, Dmitri, and finally, a certain Jamshut, 
who allegedly worked at a nearby construction site and had been actively pursuing the girl lately. Alexander was even put on the federal wanted list, but he had a 100% alibi. On the day of the tragedy, he was in Yalta, supervising the laying of asphalt in his yard. The situation with Maitri was more interesting, since in addition to the already cooled down personal relationship, he and Natalia were also connected in business. He was listed as the owner of the two premises that housed Natalia's studio. Maitri turned out to be a hard hearted landlord. He demanded a full rate even during the quarantine, and then even raised the rent. For this reason, Natalia had to take out a bank loan of 600,000 rubles. She was going to deal with him on her own. At least from Alexander's testimony and his own interview, it is clear that the debt did not particularly bother her. The investigation found no motive for her either. That left only number three, the mysterious jam shut. He first made himself known in early November of last year by sending Natalia Bouquet through a delivery service. Soon he appeared in person right outside her doorway. He grabbed her by the arm, called her his woman, and demanded to start dating. Natalia got worried and asked two close friends, who were also partners in the studio, to escort her to the door. They ended up having to be the main witnesses in the case. Jam shut defiantly ignored Natasha's guards and repeatedly tried to break through to the object of his dreams. Threats to call the police or men he knew had no effect on him. Once her friends tried to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Jam shut, they told him that Natalia already had a boyfriend and advised him to stop the harassment. But he said that he constantly sees the girl coming home alone, which means she has no one and he won't leave her alone. At the same time, he introduced himself and said that he worked at a construction site and lived with his mother. Another strange thing about Jamshut was striking. No one had ever seen his face. He appeared only wearing a medical mask and never took it off, even when he tried to make conversation. Natalia herself was sure that Jamshut was a maniac fixated on her and complained about him several times to Alexander. But here, Sitting in Yalta, he could only advise her to buy a gas can. In mid-December, about a week and a half before the tragedy, Jamshut suddenly disappeared. Natalia noted this fact, but did not pay much attention to it. During the interrogation, one of her friends said that Jamshut was the attacker. He was wearing the same clothes, and he hid his face in the same way under a medical mask. The investigation immediately alerted the media and the internet was awash with identical news headlines. The version did indeed come out quite plausible, especially since the abolition of self-imposed isolation. A wave of attacks on women swept through Moscow. They were often beaten and sometimes even stabbed on the most ridiculous pretexts. For a wrongly parked scooter, for a carelessly spoken word, for refusing to get acquainted or for settling a personal score. On that very evening of December 23rd in Moscow, two Natalias became victims at once. At about 20 o'clock, an unknown person also stopped 40-year-old Natalia Korneva who had come to the capital from Saratov and shot her in the head in front of her house on Bilovskaya Street. The girl fell into a coma from her injuries and died three days later without regaining consciousness. The investigation even tried to latch on to this similarity of names and circumstances and wanted to start working on the variant of the maniacal hunter of Natasha's. But soon it turned out that the tyrant who was rejected by her husband shot at beloved Skyapushcha, and they stopped digging in that direction. At the interrogation, the man confessed to what he had done. He said that he shot his ex-wife accidentally in a fit of jealousy. However, he may have had another motive. His cousin worked in the same firm as Corneva, in the same contract department. There were plans to reduce the number of contract workers in the commercial organization, and the management wanted to eliminate one of them. It is quite possible that this was the reason for the next portion of the aggression in the direction of the former wife. At the same time, according to the media, shortly before the tragedy, 
Corneva complained about the harassment of her colleagues and claimed that she was being watched. That could very well have been her ex-husband. Ermakov not only followed his ex-wife, but also threatened to kill her if she would not return. They had quarreled before, and so hot that Corneva was on the verge of death. Her ex-spouse sometimes put a gun to her head as an argument. About three years ago they got married. Natalia Corneva, a native of the Saratov region, moved to the new Moscow to join her husband. Yermakov beat Corneva brutally and systematically. He threw her things out the window and threw her out into the cold. But every time she was about to leave after another prank, he dramatically changed his attitude toward her. He could bring flowers in the morning and swear eternal love, but a couple of hours later he would hit her. This attitude eventually led Corneva to file for divorce, despite the fact that she confessed to her friends her great love for her ex-spouse. In September 2020th year, she divorced her husband and moved to relatives, also living in Moscow. But her ex-husband did not leave Korniv. He kept calling and writing to her and meeting her after work with flowers. He persuaded her to come back. The victim of violence by that time was already aware of the danger of the situation and was not going to return. For Yermakov, the divorce did not change anything. He, as before, oppressed the woman with the only difference that after a scandal he could not throw out of the house. Corneva, on the other hand, continued to put up with it and even as an unmarried woman did not go to the police. According to the security guard of an apartment complex in New Moscow, the woman sometimes hid in his room. When Yermakov was unleashing his hands, his wife would try to escape. Sometimes she succeeded. Then she would go down to the guards and beg them for the last time to hide her from her husband. Why didn't the victim of the beatings go to the appropriate authorities? It is still a mystery to the security officer. On the evening of December 23rd, Corneva again asked for help from the security guards. But this time it was not an apartment complex, but a business firm. She came accompanied by her ex-husband, said a PSO employee who met them at the gate. Holding her side, Corneva asked to call an ambulance. When asked what happened, she said that she fell down. The guard took a chair for the victim and then left to the back office. Already inside, according to the man's testimony, he heard gunshots. When the guard entered the parking lot, he found Natalia on the floor with a gunshot wound to the head. In addition, he managed to see a man running away, who shouted to the employee of the PSO if you call the police. I will come back and blow you up with a grenade. The trial over Alexei Yermakov has not yet taken place, so it is not yet known what sentence awaits him. We can only hope that the criminal will receive the punishment he deserves. When all the suspects in the case of Pronina were already arrested, the comparative DNA analysis showed that Jamshut, as he presented himself, was not the killer, he was a tipster. Once investigators began to check the phone of Natalia Pronina, and with it her connections, it became clear that her personal life was like a playing field for a board game with options in all directions. Many websites immediately after the tragedy began to write that her professional activities also had a double bottom. By day she worked with the children of fitness club goers, and at night she danced striptease. Yes, she worked in clubs for three years exactly, her former colleague Gangelika told Komsomolskia Pravda. Natasha is a real pro in striptease technique. Many girls studied under her, myself included. According to Angelica, later Natalia even created a separate dance project for performances at corporate parties and private parties. However, it is worth noting that strip plastic is not the same as striptease and, in general, does not involve nudity. Natalia had such a flawless command of her body that she did not need to undress in order to attract everyone's attention. She taught beautiful femininity. Vulgarity was never practiced in one voice. Almost everyone she knew told me in response to questions from the media. Around one corner, rumors swirled in social networks that Natalia was either moonlighting as an escort or was someone's concubine. However, 
the creators of TV channels for coverage of escorts denied this information. The dancer was never in their database, and all the circumstances of her life pointed to the contrary. The girl wore rather discreet clothes. In addition, the research has extracted a list of distant travels of Natalia over the past few years and did not tie up with the image of the girl on the content. She mostly traveled in Russia to Samara, Volgograd, Sachi, Astrakhan, the Crimea, and was almost always accompanied either by family members or the same pianist Dmitry. She has been abroad, occasionally going to inexpensive countries like Montenegro, Turkey or the Czech Republic. It is true that Angelica mentioned in an interview that in 2019 year Natalia visited Milan several times, but there is no reliable information about it. But even after all this gossip finally sifted away, personal life of Natalia Pronina still looked like a very tangled ball. By her 30s she had managed to do a lot, but for some reason she never had a stable relationship. Behind her were many exes. There were enough of them ready to throw bouquets at the feet of admirers. But there was no one with whom she could try to create a family. Maitri was cold and did not see Natalia as a loved one, but rather as an object of prestigious consumption. Their last attempt to rekindle their relationship, which manifested itself in the joint rent of an apartment on Prof. Nia Street, ended in nothing. The pianist simply ran away from there and quickly got himself another girl. Alexander seemed to love her, but about his move to Moscow he was not sure as in that case he would have to leave his elderly parents and six-year-old daughter in Yalta. Natalia cried when he forgot to call her. Once she took a loan to go urgently to the Crimea and even thought of moving there for good. But, apparently... This relationship for her hovered at an unstable equilibrium point. Over time, she decided it was time to stop putting all her eggs in one basket and started showing signs of attention to her admirers. After all, her own studio and other projects required money and a little luxury, at least sometimes, but still wanted. Natalia did not allow herself much but still renting a room in her favorite country hotel in Kanakavo cost about 10,000 rubles a day. At first she drew a certain rich Caucasian. He would come after her in a Bentley. He drove her to restaurants and bunches of metal bouquets to her feet. Then he was replaced by the owner of a network of car service Konstantin Taranov, with whom Natalia met nine years ago. And then the investigators finally managed to pull the long-awaited thread. As it turned out, the businessman was very amorous, and in addition to his family, in which he had children, groomed several other women. In this love polygon Natalia was clearly not welcome. At the beginning of the summer she received a bouquet with a delivery, decorated as for a funeral with the inscription for all will be rewarded, but did not attach much importance to it. The bouquet was sent by one of Taranov's mistresses, Elena Sosinkova. Having learned about Taranov's new young mistress, 54-year-old Sosinkova, apparently, was not seriously afraid for his well-being and decided to get rid of the charismatic girl. At the same time, she was much less worried about Harbo's wife and children. It is unknown how, but Sosinkova not only managed to convince Taranov that it was necessary to get rid of Natalia but also persuaded him to take over the entire process. Taranov contacted his friend Alexei Golovin and asked him to help him. Ruslan Tajarov, a native of the Caucasus, undertook the order. Together with his brother, Kasin, the intruders set up a surveillance on Natalia in hopes of learning her routine and choosing the right place and time. That's when Jemshut, played by Hazen, appeared. The original plan was for Hazen to simply spy on the girl and not make contact. But apparently he decided to act differently. When all the information had been gathered, Hazen went home to the Caucasus. In case his face did show up on camera. In this way the criminal hoped to establish an alibi, for fear of being traced by the investigators. Before that, on December 15th, the Tajirov brothers together with Golovin, attacked the man and stole his car. 
The man then feared to go to the police. And later, Russell and Tajira fled from the scene of the crime in this very car after the shots were fired. After the arrest, the Tajirov's mother tried vigorously to assure the journalists that her sons do not even understand what they are accused of. But they can't argue with the results of DNI analysis. At the moment, the trial is not over and the verdict is still to be announced. However, given the number of articles the whole gang is charged with, it will be a very long time before they get out.